Welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. Do you know of a family down the street or next door where you'll hear strange noises and the children will suddenly be wearing long sleeve to cover their arms in the hot heat of summer? Well, if you do, make it a point, take an interest, because obviously there is child abuse. My guest today, Marilyn Scott, has written one of the most touching books about her early life. It's called In Our House, Perceptions and Reality. Welcome, Marla. Thank you, Connie, for having me. Well, it's my pleasure, and I don't know when I have read a book that touched me so. Here you are, the only girl of, what, five brothers. Yes. Your father is a very substantial important man as a black man in a company that doesn't usually hire. And your mother is a stay-at-home mother who is persecuted by her husband. Yes. Where, what have I left out? Is it about how he verbally not only beats you, but physically, such as your brother Colin, where there had been fire crack, he beats everybody in the house. And I'm talking physically. Yes, um, with the exception of the two youngest children because they were so young and dad, people couldn't tell. They didn't know. He didn't have any signs that people cared to see that he was like that because he was a very polished, intelligent professional recruited by both IBM and the CIA when he graduated college with five children and one on the way. So he got away with it a lot. And then he even goes on to get a master's degree. Yes, Dad and went on. you and the children, other children, attend his graduation. Yes. Uh, we attended his graduation when he had his bachelor's degree, and uh, the five of us, and my mom was pregnant with my youngest brother, Selvin, and um, it actually made the newspaper because it was such a big deal to see an African-American in that time yeah. period graduate with five children and do extremely well. He worked three jobs all the way through college. Is that also part do you think of the mental reason he was so abusive? And Absolutely. I do mean really abusive. Absolutely. I mean, Dad went through a lot of, um, he had reasons to him. Uh, to me, some were excuses, some were valid in his world, but he had a lot of discrimination in the environment that he worked, raising the pressure of having so many children in that time. And he didn't want to be like his father. He wanted to be very successful in his career, but he made the mistake of having so many children so early on, which yeah. kind of helped. Which he blames on your mother. His problems, yes. <laughs> As yeah. if he had not had any anything part. to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And when he would take that belt buckle and use the buckle to really scar the kids. Well, the scars are still there. The buckle was temporary, and the way it would rip the skin off of my brothers, it, it was very terrible. It was a terrible thing to see, especially since being children. And when you have the force of a grown man coming at you to do that, it's not child-to-child -child fighting. It's a man truly abusing a child, and it was traumatic, yeah. to say the least. He didn't really abuse you as much. No, he didn't. He would yell, he would do, say things, you're no good. And I mean, the words he used were hardly uh, polite. True. Uh, Dad had his way. People don't understand. Abuse takes many forms. Physical abuse, mental abuse. And the mental abuse that we had, knowing that I was always inadequate to him and I was never enough and never what he wanted as a child or a daughter or whatnot, it encompassed a lot. It took a lot to kind of get rid of a lot of things he felt about me yeah. throughout my life. It took a long time. Your mother is, there are three women who show up in sort of like nuns' costumes to your mother. They come and they close the blinds. They say, we have tea for you, which I assume must have had something in it. I agree, yes. And they, it, they really seduce her into a cult. Yes. Well, from the time that they came to the door, I knew something was wrong with the way they began to interact with mom. And they said they were from you know, this church and mom was kind of very skeptical, but she was so broken from the abuse that had taken place, she was willing to take whatever help she can get, you know, quite honestly. And they promised to make sure that my father never hurt her or us, which was more what she was trying to protect us. But before long, she became intertwined in working with them. And by the time she knew it and really had a good scope on things, they had her summoning demons and 
uh -huh. those sort of things in him. I must say that there is humor in this book, such as when your father insists on going to her baptism. Yes. yes. And no men were supposed to sit in front. No children were supposed to be there. And he sort of looks them in the eye and he says, I'm here. Right. Dad made his own path. That's why he graduated and did so well in what he did and was recruited, like I said, by IBM and the CIA uh, right out of college. But he did what he wanted. And when he went into that church, you know, as soon as I told him, I said, Dad, do you notice there's something missing? And he said, basically, you know, I know there's no crosses, there's no yeah. sign of God here. So we knew something was wrong. And the men were all in the back of the church. Mm -hmm. The women were all in the front. The men were like they were in a trance. And it was very obvious. It was evident that it was not a church. Yeah. Well she does the baptism and she stays with them to a degree yes. and then you see her drifting off where she's hearing voices and she is sitting not clothed at all or dressed or made up and she is disintegrating in front of your eyes it was a period of years that she went through that and she was actually possessed by multiple demons she had two exorcisms throughout her life that i was aware of and they didn't help she was institutionalized, that didn't help. But mom had, um, I watched her go through a beautiful state. I mean, absolutely stunning because she was a dancer and very athletic, deteriorated, like you said, yeah. teeth rotten, some were knocked out, all badly beaten and bruised. Those bruises were still there, but yeah. her physical deterioration because of the demons, she lost every sense of beauty that she had. It was no longer there. You couldn't recognize her. He has, I mean, again, a horror scene is when he has the men from the mental institution come and take her to the hospital. Before that, the boys, I mean, Stan finally leaves to go to the Navy, and it's as if he's breaking the shackles that have held him. We were, it was very touching when he actually left to the yeah. Navy for the simple fact that we didn't think any of us would make it out of that house alive. And we were celebrating the fact that he yeah. did. And he was actually beaten as a child before he was even here. My father stomped on him and, you know, when he was in my mother's womb and beat her so badly, she had him at five months old. And he had to fight throughout his life. From the time that he made it into this world, he was fighting. And he left it, you know, yeah. that house fighting. To get there out. is a scene, too, where the firecrackers and your mother is trying to protect everything from your father seeing it. Yes. And Colin's face was burnt, the hair was gone, and he's got a cap on, and your father says, what, in essence, what the hell is going on here? Exactly. It was because when Clark, um, Colin actually brought the firecrackers into the home and it instigated the situation, and mom said, don't, you know, don't do anything yeah. that's going to upset your father. But when Clark, his eyebrows, he was such a, the kind of kid that was like, okay, it's not working, it's yeah. not lighting, and he put his face down to it, blew up his face, eyebrows gone, wearing yeah. a cap. Dad knew something was wrong, but my mother and my eldest brother Stan drew eyebrows on him and yeah. facial hair to make him look semi-normal. Yeah. It didn't work, but there was... You know, a lot yeah. of that that was kind of in between our life, that the humor was just, like you said, it was what it was. And it was, yeah. it was funny, but he, he looked terrible. And we couldn't take him to the doctors because yeah. someone would have been beaten for that. Well, a couple of times where they should have gone to the emergency room, you couldn't because then they would say, what do you mean, who choked this boy? Exactly. And getting him to breathe again was certainly traumatic enough. Well, watching my brother being beaten so badly that he was knocked unconscious and he wasn't breathing, Dad simply had him, you know, carried him upstairs, threw him in a tub filled with water and ice to revive him. Yeah. And that was routine for us. Yeah. It was so hard to watch that because it was like watching your brother die and you can't say anything and you can't help him. Watching yeah. them being beaten, you can't say anything. And the marks yeah. that they had on them yeah. were overwhelmingly just the sickest form of abuse that you yeah. can see. Uh, your mother goes off, your father divorces her, and marries Sarah. Yes. At which point, you miss your mother. And you're saying, not that nice to Sarah, who's the other woman. And your father takes it out on you. He throws you against the wall. He hits you, and he throws you down the stairs to the basement and says, that's where you're going to live from here on in. You don't come out except yes. for 10 minutes a day. I, I mean... 
it, the Nazis didn't do what's bad. <laughs> well, you know what's sad is that I knew he hated me from the beginning, and when Mom was no longer there yeah. and he remarried, I was a constant reminder of her. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people tell me I look very much like her, and I used to always say, okay, where's my beauty? Because she was yeah. absolutely stunning. But Sarah and took your side. Oh, Sarah backed me later after yeah. she saw his yeah. signs of him being get, beginning to abuse her. Yeah. But when I first told her, she said, oh, he wouldn't do this. This isn't the kind of man I married. And she went and told him. Yeah. And because I was trying to help her and say, look, you know, do you even know what happened to my yeah. mother? He beat me for it in a way that it will never, ever, ever right. be forgotten. How did you break out? You were running track. He didn't want you to do it. But once you did it, oh, ho, ho, I'm so proud of my daughter. Yeah. Well, that was dead. Anything outside of the home that made yeah. him look good, he would gravitate to. But yeah. inside the home, that was a perception versus our reality. And when I ran track, that was an escape for me because I felt like I was running. It gave me a release. And being in that home with an abusive father, a possessed mother, all the abuse that we had to deal, my brothers being abused terribly, as well as myself in, in several situations, I had to find something that was a healthy outlet, and that was it. Your brothers, where are they now? Oh, my brothers are um, scattered all over the country, basically. One in California, one in, two in a couple in New York, and my brother, uh, one is a detective um, in Ohio. So, yeah. Do they yeah. keep in touch? Yes. Yes, yeah. we, do. we do. And your father has passed on. Yes. Yeah. He did pass on. Um, it was traumatic in a lot of ways because there were a lot of unresolved emotions with that. And sometimes you can settle some areas, and he did tell me that he was sorry that he kept me in the room with my mother. He should have never done that. But to me, I always felt it was more like a psychological study for him because he was so intelligent. I think he wanted to see if what happened to my mother would happen to me. Oh, come on. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a big rationalization oh, yeah. for him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what he would say, and I, never, I could never accept that. Yeah. And How much analysis or help have you had? Well, a lot of my help came through the way of writing this memoir because yeah. I needed to get it out and I wanted people to understand my mother's life wasn't in vain. These things happen behind closed doors all the time and it kind of helped me get a lot of emotions, unresolved issues and analyze things as I grew older. So it yeah. took years, over 13 years I began writing it oh. and I started right out of uh, high school so I can yeah. have the memories fresh. Well, I thank you because I hope people will read it and take a look around them at what's going on and do something. Don't just sit there. Right. Well, we all have a choice to make and we yeah. can, you know, have to forgive. I had to forgive my father for what happened in order to be able to be in the state that I am now. And when you let go of a lot of pain in a childhood like that, which most people can't understand how you can, it helps you better able to live. I can understand. But I have to say, it had to be very painful writing it. Oh, it was being in that room again. It was yeah. like living my life all over again, which took so long to write because it was very j emotionally jarring. Yeah. Where you can't, when you think of your mother talking to demons and you hear those voices and you're writing that down and, and trying to separate it. And you're a child sharing a room. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Being in that room, no one can imagine that. But when people read the book and they see that aspect of my life, they wonder how I got to where I am now. And it yeah. takes a lot of forgiving in a journey that you have to go How on. many children do you have now? I have my son who um, is here and my daughter uh, who is actually in college studying psychology and I tease her that she'll never be able to fix me after the childhood, yeah. but yeah. That's great because they do write an afterword for yes. you. Will you autograph Absolutely. my book? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. we'll be back after a short pause with Alison Wynn Scotch, author of The Song Remains the Same.